So Phil, what did you do before IRPS? Well, before IRPS, I worked with uh, consulting for as much as four years in different areas. Um, I worked in different research institutes. I have a lot of experience with model United Nations. And I've lived in different countries and I kind of had this international experience that I, I guess was one of the reasons why I came here to IRPS. How about you? <laughs> um, well, I, I've had a number of different jobs before I came to IRPS. Um, after undergrad, I worked for the World Bank in Sri Lanka, working on private sector development, um, on the development of the knowledge economy. And then I moved on to film. And I worked in film finance at Pixar for a little while, just managing the budgets of various projects. And then I went on to um, work for a big consulting firm doing defense consulting, um, supporting a telecommuni telecommunications program for the US Navy. Do that. So uh, what did you do for internship during your summer? So this past summer, I was in Ghana, and I worked for um, an organization called um, Innovations for Poverty Action. And they're basically, um, they do design and evaluation um, for research pro various research projects. And I specifically worked um, on an impact evaluation, um, studying, um, trying to measure the impact of knowledge extension on farming methods. So we like we did a ton of research on ground nuts and maize. I know more about maize than I ever <laughs> thought I would know. So what's your favorite IRPS memory so far? Um, my favorite IRPS memory, actually I have a lot of them, are combined with something I didn't expect before uh, coming to campus, which is essentially uh, the countless nights I have spent mm -hmm. uh, working until 4 a.m. in the morning with uh, some of the people that I know I'm going to uh, keep as friends for a long time. Great. Um, I am right there with you. <laughs> it's really kind of shocking because IRPS is sort of this, pro it's one of the most social programs, I think graduate programs at US UCSD and probably, probably in general. So there's always tons of events. I mean, we have like the talent show and Asian New Year Festival. Um, but I would have to completely agree with you. The strangest, like the best memories I've had have been sitting in the computer lab at 4 a.m. trying to work on a problem set and you just, you've been, you know, typing away at something, I'm thinking of Stata right now, and it's something just clicks finally, hours later, and you just like 4 a.m. want to scream it from the rooftops. I mean, I feel like that, those are those moments that I'm always going to remember and they've been some of my best memories. Today, we are going to meet Professor Gordon Henson, who teaches international economics and international trade. He's currently researching international immigration and trade. So, today we're interested in learning more about you. Um, so, if you can, please tell us a little, little bit about your background, where you're originally from, and when and how you decided to enter the field of academia. So, uh, my family uh, was living in Thailand in the 1960s, when, uh, during the time I was born. And so I kind of grew up around the field of international development, thinking about the problems of poor countries and what do you do to make yourself better off. Um, we then later moved back to California. We lived in Central California in an area where there were lots of migrant workers coming in from Mexico. And so I kind of grew up thinking about globalization, even though as a, you know, as a 13-year-old, I didn't call it that. Um, uh, but it informed kind of my interest, and as when I went to college, I naturally gravitated toward economics and a little bit of political science. And um, I, I loved school. I was really interested in learning more about Latin America, spending time living and working there. My professors, just kind of following their advice, I ended up uh, doing a PhD in, in, in economics. Um, it was a you know, little bit happenstance, but it just it felt like the most natural thing uh, uh, in the world to me. Um, Professor Hansen, at, at IRPS you teach topics of international trade. Uh, what would you say is the most valuable takeaway from this class for students? So that course comes uh, at the end of your time at, at IRPS. So by that time you've done your, your first year core courses, you've mastered economics, you've mastered uh, the QM sequence. And so what I want to do is help you develop an applied set of tools that you can use in economic modeling in your professional life. So my goal if, uh, for, the, for students coming out of that class is to, be, uh, is to be professional producers of economic analysis. And so in that class, as distinct from earlier classes you take in RPS, don't do any more theory. Don't do any more problem sets. Don't work with textbooks. I give you data, and I ask you to, uh, ask you to, to analyze that data and answer practical uh, questions. 
Um, one set of questions is involving trade data, thinking about the impact of trade agreements on trade flows between countries. So the type of analysis you might do if you were a Ministry of Trade official or working for the Treasury Department or working for a company that was interested in uh, you know, understanding how trade agreements were going to change international commerce. And the second half involves analysis of, um, of lab labor market data on, on immigration that is useful for thinking about sort of, sort of all manner of questions related to wages, employment, globalization. <coughs> Next question. Um, so you, so most faculty at IRPS have a very strong research agenda. Can you please tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on in the past and some that are some that you're working on now? So I'm an international economist, and so what I really study is the causes and consequences of globalization. So that means I think of globalization as being the process that moves people and goods and ideas and capital uh, between countries. So about half of my research has uh, uh, been about understanding the rise of global production networks. So now you look at the way modern trade works, and it's not uh, what it's kind of not what textbooks say, where you know one country might produce cars and another country country might produce wheat, and we trade cars for wheat. The way modern firms organize production is to divide that production into a series of stages: producing parts, producing components. Um, the marketing, the distribution, and doing each stage in the country where it can be done at, at, at least cost. So my research involves understanding you know, how do these production networks arise, what are the policy uh, uh, factors that influence their, their, their structure and their performance, and then how does uh, that feature of globalization in turn uh, impact uh, countries that are, uh, that are affected. And the other half of my, uh, my research is about international migration, so another aspect of um, of, of globalization, understanding how the flows of people between countries affects wages and employment in both the countries where people leave and the countries where people go. What would you say is unique about the IRPS curriculum? So we have a, we have a couple of, uh, features uh, in our curriculum that you just won't find in any other international affairs school. Um, one is uh, we are deeply grounded in trying to understand the economics and politics of, of, uh, of the Pacific Rim of Asia and, uh, and Latin America. You know, most international fair schools are located on the East Coast, and they still kind of have this European mindset. They're stuck in the 20th century, some of them in the 19th. Uh, we are firmly in the 21st century, in which the locus of, of the dynamism in the global economy is in the Pacific. And that's, where, uh, that's what our research is about, that's what our teaching is about, that's what our, 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 uh, our programmatic activities are about. The other thing that distinguishes us is that, you know, we're, rather than being a collection of people who kind of bounce back and forth between government and academics, we have a few people that do that. We're, um, we're real academics. Um, and what that means is we want you to learn those real skills. So the rigor of our program, the analytical depth of our program, is just much greater than you're going to find at, uh, at, at other international fair schools. As a consequence, our students who walk out, I think because of the bo those both features, the Pacific focus and that stronger analytical um, and, and to some extent quantitative uh, grounding, our students end up being um, more attractive to the private sector than students from other international fair schools. So we end up sending a higher fraction of our students to the private sector than, than any other international fair school that, that, that I'm aware of. How do you spend your free time outside class in your research? Okay, uh, a great question. Um, I, uh, I love free time. Uh, so I have, uh, I have two daughters who are 12 and, uh, and 15. So a big chunk of my time uh, is involved with stuff they do. So I've coached my daughter's soccer team for, uh, for seven years now. Um, and we just do a lot of, us, a lot of stuff as, uh, as a family. Most of it seems to revolve around their, their sporting events. Um, in Southern California, um, I make full uh, use of access to the ocean. Uh, so I surf and paddle. Um, you can usually find me out uh, somewhere in the water between 6 and 6.30 in the morning. Um, it's been a cold winter, so it's been, uh, that's been a, a little rough on me uh, this winter when it's 38 degrees, but, uh, uh, but I love it. It's, uh, it's how I start my day. I'm a better person when I get out of the water than when I went in. Um, as, a, uh, as a Brazilian, one thing that attracted me to RPS was try to understand how the businesses in Asia impact not only Brazil but Latin America 
and this is one of the things that brought me to RPS. So can you elaborate a little bit more of how you understand the trade dynamics between the two most important regions of the 21st century? Sure. Um, so you know th that approach that you've taken to your graduate studies really characterizes where IRPS is today. 20 years ago, uh, I don't think anyone at, at IRPS would have had that perspective. Folks who would have come from Latin America would have come to, to study kind of what's happening in Latin America and then gone home and had their focus on their economies. And folks from, uh, from Asia, too. So uh, today, though, what do we see? We see this tremendous interaction between uh, emerging economies that is really driving what's happen, happening on, um, uh, on global markets. So take, um, take China and Brazil, just as, as, as two examples. You know, China, with its spectacular economic growth, is really the driver of the global economy right now. Um, and thank goodness for that, because the U.S. and Europe and Japan certainly aren't capable of, uh, of playing the role. So what does that mean for uh, Brazil? Well, China's comparative advantage is strongly oriented towards manufacturing. So they make, they make the machinery and the consumer products and, uh, and all those other uh, manufactured items that, that global consumers buy. But to make that stuff, you need inputs. Uh, you need raw materials. Um, Brazil certainly has some strong manufacturing sectors, but it has some uh, it has some strengths that China doesn't have. In particular, in commodities, so in soy, in oil, in steel, um, uh, and in other uh, agricultural products. And so China's growth then has increased this demand for the stuff that Brazil produces, leading to. Uh, an income boom back in Brazil. So that connection, China's growth and, and Brazil's growth are intimately connected. So, you know, as you, you look at property prices in Brazil today, land's probably more expensive today than it was uh, 10 years ago. That's largely uh, due to China. Um, and you see the same thing if you go to, uh, uh, if you go to Chile, if you go to Peru, um, other parts of Latin America that are really oriented around supplying commodities and raw materials to the manufacturing-oriented economies of, uh, of Asia. So that's been great for economic growth in those, in those regions. You know, it also creates some risks, right, because you get focused on a few particular markets uh, for a few particular goods, which means when a downturn comes, you know, it can, uh, it can be painful. So one of the things that Latin American economies have been thinking about is, well, as we become more specialized, how do we kind of plan for the rainy day? How do we plan for adjustment? Chile's really been at the forefront uh, of this uh, with other countries uh, uh, following suit. So this growing integration between Asia and Latin America just makes it a very exciting time uh, uh, to, do, uh, to do what we do. For a long time, we were uh, you know, preaching that yeah, this integration is going to be increasingly important for people's careers. We don't need to preach that anymore. You know, our students come here and say, I see it. This is what, this is what my career is going to be about. Thank you, Professor <laughs> Thanks so Madison. much.